So last week on the channel, I made a video talking about the Nintendo 64 games that were offered on the Nintendo Switch Online or NSO expansion pack and the overall disappointment that I had with that particular offering of games. Now, one area that I didn't focus on was previous emulation efforts that were offered by Nintendo going as far back as the Nintendo GameCube. So there was some discussion around whether a community-based emulator like Project 64 or Moopin Plus 64 should be better than a commercially developed one. And that's definitely interesting to consider. But one area that I didn't focus on in the last video was the comparison with in-house developed efforts by Nintendo over the years. And for this, we need to go all the way back to the Nintendo GameCube. On the GameCube, there existed an N64 emulator that was internally developed by Nintendo to run the Legend of Zelda Ocarina of Time. And it was really, really good. On the Wii Virtual Console, as we know, N64 games ran there as well, and overall they were quite excellent. But something obviously along the way got lost. The Wii U Virtual Console was significantly worse than the Wii Virtual Console, and the NSO service that we just talked about last week, in general, is overall even worse than the Wii U Virtual Console. Now before we jump in, I want to give thanks to Twitter user known as Kieran, who made a really great thread about this very same topic. And I'm going to leave a link to that thread in the description below. So big thanks to him for really kind of bringing this to light. This is something that's very interesting to talk about and something that I want to cover on the channel. So. Going back to 2002, Nintendo released The Legend of Zelda Wind Waker. And at the time, it was quite polarizing because a lot of people weren't happy with the direction of Wind Waker with the cell shaded graphics. But that's a completely different story, not on topic for this episode. But in somewhat of an unprecedented move, they would also offer a second disc known as the Master Quest, which was a promotional item. And this was a limited edition bonus disc that contained Ocarina of Time, as well as a version known as Master Quest, which was essentially the same game, but with more difficult dungeons, hence the Master Quest name. Now, it's believed that this version of Ocarina of Time was actually a port to the GameCube, but it in fact was running a Nintendo 64 emulation all the way back in 2002 and on the Nintendo GameCube. Now behind the scenes, the emulator to power Ocarina of Time on the GameCube was developed by NST or Nintendo Software Technology. And it was somewhat of an experimental one-off. And again, it was offered as a promotional item for Wind Waker. Now the development team at NST was led by a developer known as Stephen Lee. And he was very well versed and very skilled in emulation development and knew the ins and out of the Nintendo 64. And the result of this was it ran great. Now, it had some minor rendering issues, but overall it was a high quality. The fog effect that's plagued the NSO version is certainly not present here. It took advantage of the GameCube controller and the input lag was quite low. In fact, if you played it on a CRT and you compared it to a real N64, it was an absolute dream. It was very difficult to detect any input lag at all. Now, the emulation, while not perfect, is pretty damn good, especially for the Nintendo GameCube. The problem was, at the time, this was a promotional item. It was mostly overlooked because Wind Waker and later Twilight Princess were obviously the main focus. Everyone had moved on from the N64 at this time, but the end result of this would be that the promotional experiment with an N64 emulator was a success. And Nintendo then decided that they would bring their classic games to their next console, the Nintendo Wii, with the Virtual Console. Now, Stephen Lee and his team updated and brought their game across to the Nintendo Wii. And the result of this was 21 individual N64 games that ran on the Virtual Console. And these came out from a time frame between 2006 to 2011. The Wii Virtual Console versions of N64 games are considered in general to be the best ones around. Once again, Ocarina of Time ran great, better than the GameCube version, and Majora's Mask was made available on this service as well, and it was quite incredible. Now, one of the big reasons why the emulation was so good was that each N64 title ran its own unique version of the emulator, which was specifically tailored and tuned for that game. Any game-specific adjustments that were needed were compiled into the emulator. And this, as a result, offered the 
best experience that you could get short of original hardware. The results on N64 on the Nintendo Wii Virtual Console were fantastic at the time. Games like Mario Tennis and Mario Kart 64 ran very well, and all those frame buffer effects that I've talked about in the past were all in place. But unfortunately, this would be the last time that we would see good N64 commercial emulation offered by Nintendo. In 2011, Steven had left Nintendo, and in 2012, when Nintendo brought their 21 titles to the Nintendo Wii U Virtual Console, they were a lot worse than the Wii versions, which on paper doesn't make a lot of sense considering that the Wii U is more powerful than the Nintendo Wii. But what actually happened behind the scenes was, rather than utilizing Steven's work on the Nintendo Wii U, Nintendo decided to use an overarching emulator that they had built that would power all 21 games. And this was a bad choice for them because it introduced things like input lag, audio glitches, rendering issues, things that were game specific that were compiled into the emulator on the Wii Virtual Console were now being patched in on the fly. And this was a poor design choice. Worse still was that the N64 emulation on the Wii U contains a black filter that's applied to all 21 games. This filter completely washes out the colors, making the final image very dull, especially when you compare it to the original color palettes. And the end result of this, it just looks really bad. And unfortunately, the filter cannot be removed unless you have access to a homebrew modded Wii U and a way to do some ROM hacking. And here we are in 2021 with the N64 offerings on the Nintendo Switch Online. Now, I've already talked about my disappointment and my concerns with the service, but the changes are obvious. Nintendo has moved away from a workflow where they offered a specific emulator for a specific game with custom patching per game to now a generic and overarching single emulator and are attempting to patch things such as performance and enhancements with scripting on the fly, which can have a negative effect on the overall look and feel. N64 emulation has always been complex to solve and this is a real shame. We've seen N64 emulation with the Wii Virtual Console be exceptional and since then unfortunately things have regressed. But the main takeaway of this video really is just to illustrate that yes, Nintendo does care about emulation. They have for many, many years, but unfortunately in the last 10 years or so, they've kind of lost their way and they've made some interesting design choices that have really just kind of impacted the user experience of some of these games. And hopefully they can rectify some of these things. I don't know if they will, but Again, I just wanted to make this video to really just clarify some of the things that have been going on over the years with N64 emulation that Nintendo has developed themselves. But once again, I want to give a big thanks to Twitter user Kieran for his thread because it was really something that made me want to just jump in and take a close look at this stuff. But we are going to leave it here for this episode. Thank you so much for watching. Let me know your thoughts in the comments below. And as always, don't forget to like and subscribe and I'll catch you guys in the next video. Bye for now.